This is episode 56 with photographer, shark attack survivor, marine life advocate, and surfer, Mike Coots. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. Welcome back to the first show of 2018. I missed you all and this podcast, but I'm excited to be back with our first guest of the year, Mike Coots. When Mike was 18, he lost his leg to a shark while bodyboarding in Hawaii. He survived by punching it in the face. Today, Mike is actually a shark and marine life advocate. He's also a world-class photographer, a competitive surfer, and a big advocate for adaptive athletes. He's full of amazing stories, including how he's devised a system so he could stand up surf. We met up in La Jolla, California when he was in town for the Stance ISA Adaptive Games, and it was a real treat. I hope you enjoy the show. This episode was brought to you by REI Co-op, a brand who not only gets you the gear you need to get outside, but helps you get out there and explore. Anytime I've had a big adventure, whether it was volunteering in Costa Rica, even hiking in Yosemite, I've loaded up on gear at REI. I've always loved their inclusive approach and the fact the brand provides tons of education on and off the storefront floors. I've taken lots of classes at REI, like orienteering, rock climbing techniques, even beginning backpacking. They also have great experiences and trips like safaris to Tanzania, trekking in the Alps, backpacking trips through the Great Smoky Mountains, and so many more. I've been a member since 1996, and I'm excited to partner with them on the show this year. You can go to REI.com to check out the latest gear, classes, experiences, to find a store near you, and to read great stories about adventure and the outdoors. All right, I'm here with Mike Coots. Mike, welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you. So I think we should just start. You're a photographer now. You've you've been taking pictures of sharks. So how has taking pictures of sharks, I mean, they're the most beautiful images I've been seeing. How has that sort of changed your perception of them? Um, I, I would say first, it, it uh, when I first started diving with sharks, I was a bit nervous um, just of the nature of me being a shark attack survivor and, and diving with a predator that nearly took my life. And I think by having a camera, I'm a photographer by trade, by having a camera in my hand, it kind of gave me something to do and I, I guess take my mind off that I'm swimming around with sharks. It, it kind of gives me a, a purpose when I'm underwater. I'm a bit of a E-type personality, so I'm always adjusting settings and, and really trying to get the best possible shot. So maybe it's not I guess the best vessel when you're diving with sharks to, to be keeping your eyes really off off of a big fish like that and, and looking at a camera so much. But I think in my case, it helps me a little bit. And um, I, I also want, I love to share, I guess, what I'm capturing. I don't know. People think of sharks as these man-eating creatures that just want to rip flesh from you. And when I photograph sharks, I, I, I went to college and I majored in portraiture. And I I really sort of, you, you learn in portraiture to focus on the eyes. And the eyes is the soul of, of a creature and when I'm shooting sharks I'm really not trying to focus on the teeth or the jaws but I guess put that little square dot where your focus point is right on the eyeball and show that sharks have life and they're intelligent and they're not these vicious man-eating creatures and I, I think that sort of comes across through my photography um, and I hope to sort of personify sharks and and you know these guys are intelligent not indiscriminate um i, I guess that's my real goal as sh sh as a shark photographer yeah i've never spent any time with sharks so i'd love for you to tell me a little bit about you know some of the things that stick maybe break some of the stigmas for me i have about sharks yeah down. yeah well i mean as as a surfer your experience with sharks is on the surface yeah. um it, it seems like what below you is this deep dark void and i think a lot of maybe your average ocean goer to your swimmer to your surfer sharks are deep down scary animals um and, and that's you know that's okay but when you put on a mask and you grab some scuba tanks or you grab a snorkel and you actually go underwater and you're in clear visibility and you actually have time to sort of slow your breathing down and look around you and see what they're doing it's there's nothing really like this on earth it's absolutely incredible i feel like 
you're you're in maybe half a Pixar movie combined <laughs> with like half a crazy acid trip. It's like it's totally surreal. It, it the sharks are doing like this dance underwater. They're choreographed beautifully. Um, you have visual eye contact with them. You feel like you're really looking into like a you know a a soul. It's amazing. And they're so smart. Like how. First of all, how did you learn about sharks? Like, did you, after your accident, I, I read that you started reading pretty voraciously about them. Yeah. But then... I was very curious after getting attacked why I got attacked. And I started going to the library and getting shark attack books. Um, you, you go to the library and, and ask, the, you know, the librarian, give me the shark section. You walk over there and nine out of ten books is about shark attacks. Um, wow. So I just, I, I sat at home and I read shark attack after shark attack, trying to figure out, you know, was it the tide that I got attacked? Is that the reason? Was it the reason because of the moon phase and looking at other attacks in my area and trying to see what time of year and just really trying to, I guess, put together the pieces of the puzzle. And it was like, why did I get attacked? Why did I get attacked? And then a few years later, I got a phone call from a shark attack survivor from Florida, um, this lady named Debbie. And she was like, we're putting together a, a small group of shark attack survivors and, and curious if they would lobby for shark conservation. And I was like, shark conservation? Wow. What is that? I've never heard that word before. It doesn't come up in the shark attack books. How old were you around? I, I would have been, I got attacked by the tiger shark when I was 18. And this would have been when I was about 24, 23, 24. So what year was this? About? This would have been about 2003, 2004, okay. I would say. Um, and yeah, and I was like, shark it you know this is a new word this is conservation uh, yeah I, I haven't heard of this and um yeah shark conservation and um she's like watch this documentary by rob stewart called shark water and sure enough it was right there on youtube for free and i remember my girlfriend that night we we put it on and we watched it and this number came up of how many sharks a year were killed in the hundreds of millions like uh, i think it was about a hundred million at the time and I was like, what? This is not right. This is, you know, when I rewound that number, and I was like, this is a typo. And I did a Google search, and sure enough, and um, I, the movie really, I guess, it struck a tone in my heart. It, I really, you know, the, there's more to these creatures than, I guess, than, than what the media tells us, what shark attack books tell us, what, you know, Jaws tells us. Um, and, and the more I learned, I guess, the more I felt compelled to help. And we had a shark bill coming through at the time in our, our local... Um, a, lo a state house and it was to um basically make uh, shark fin contraband um possession of shark fin you it was like having drugs and it was to kind of stem the shark fin trade which hawaii was a big sort of marketplace because really? we were we were very close to asia where a lot of the consumption is and um i became involved in uh, the political process of getting a state bill passed and it got passed we were very wow. fortunate we were the, actually the first state to do so congrats thank you yeah. so what's the what's the bill so the bill is, is a, it's a, a shark finning bill, and it's basically if you have any shark fin product um, dried in a soup, anything at all that's a shark fin that's detached from the shark itself, completely legal with stiff fines and possible jail time. So there is a bit of teeth behind the law. It's not just a slap on the wrist. Um, and it's been very effective. States have soon followed. We had a, a federal bill here that sort of closed a lot of loopholes on the state bills. I was fortunate to be involved in that process, um, talking to senators and in Washington, and then we've we've um, worked with the United Nations um, on an international level, trying to create shark sanctuaries around the world. Um, each each country or some countries that that really feel sharks play an important part of their, their marine ecosystem, um, they'll have a shark sanctuary or an area that's like a no fishing limits, but they're next to a bordering area or a bordering country that doesn't. And fish, you know, they don't know borders. Sharks yeah. don't know borders; they swim through. So it's basically grouping together these ocean nations um, side by side and creating big swaths of protected areas in the world where sharks can, you know, swim freely. Wow. How can we learn more about that if, if we want to um, do? I would say start, watch Shark Water. Um, incredible film. Okay. Um, unfortunately, uh, Rob's passed away. Um, he, he was an avid uh, shark conservationist and he passed away doing what he loved doing. And um, it, it's... It kind of goes to testament of, I mean, he was, he, he passed away diving really deep to try and find more sharks because there's just less and less sharks. Mm. Um, and he died doing what he's loved and, and there's going to be shark water two coming out soon. Sort of, um, he was just, it was one of the last scenes that he filmed when he passed away. Wow. Um, but he's been, he's been a big inspiration in my life. So how did you get into, did you get into diving after your attack or? Yeah. Um, I, I grew up on the island of Kauai and we're surrounded by, um, obviously a lot of Pacific ocean yeah. and. My childhood was spent snorkeling. Uh, I, every summer, the surf goes flat for a while, so I would dive with my buddies, uh, spearfish, snorkel, um, almost every day in the summer. And um, it was a really cool way to grow up. Um, I got certified when I was, I believe, 14. 
um, for scuba diving. Cool. But then surf, I guess surfing kind of takes over when you get to the teen years. And I was I was just avidly riding waves. I was actually a bodyboarder um, all through high school, a very avid bodyboarder. That's so wild. You're a bodyboarder. In Hawaii, bodyboarding is like the coolest ever. Yeah. Um, we've, we've got a lot of like rampy waves and, and sort of these slab waves that are kind of, it really fits that craft. And so after you were about 18, you, you started getting in. When did you get into stand-up surfing? Um, so I was a bodyboarder when I got attacked uh, by the shark. And I got accepted to a photography school in Santa Barbara. And I was in school for a little over a year or so. And, and the waves in Santa Barbara, there's these perfect little point breaks. Mm. I mean, it is it is an absolute surfer's heaven. Um, for bodyboarding, not so much. It, it doesn't have those slabs. It doesn't have those... Uh, I guess punchy air sections and I was told not to take my prosthetic in the water um, that it would void the warranty and it would it'd probably break and oh. and you know when you're telling don't do this don't do this don't do this and then one day the sun is out it's hot there's these perfect little point break waves I've got a friend's longboard right next to me and I'm sitting on the sand and I'm like you know what let's just do this I'm gonna take this in the water and see what happens and sure enough it, it didn't fall apart and my prosthetist wasn't completely you know super pissed off and, and it worked and i 10 minutes later i was riding away with my prosthetic it was it was really cool that's awesome and right now we're actually at the isa adaptive games and you're going to compete correct the event is a uh, about a block away and uh it's the third annual world championships there's competitors from all over the world and the technology the the um, level of surfing has come a long way since then yeah, I want, you told me when we were on the phone that you're really into the technology of, of prosthetic legs. And can you just talk to me a little bit about, you know, the, the first prototype you got and how you've been able to create legs that really work and move in the surf? Because I just think the technology behind it is so interesting. And the way you you first got introduced to yeah. prosthetic legs. Yeah, when I when I caught that first wave at Ledbetter, I was on a, a prosthetic foot that had a rubber ball joint. Uh, the rubber was sort of a, I guess, a damper. It was also your flex. Um, so all your energy, your stored, your, your kinetic energy before it's returned is stored in this rubber. And there gets very little return. And the, it was not the best, I guess, material for surfing. And I would, I didn't have a, a I didn't really have insurance and insurance uh, wouldn't even cover a surfing prosthetic. So what I would do is go on eBay Jeez. and find feet on eBay. Um, I, I, yeah, and I, I got this one. This Wait, you find like feet on yeah, eBay. Yeah, you just... type you type in prosthetic feet on eBay, and sure enough, uh, <laughs> you'll get you'll get results. And that's great. Um, and sometimes you get very little results, and sometimes you mm -hmm. get ten feet at one time, which is what I did for f I think three hundred dollars. Wow. Which, yeah, which was a, a really good deal. And that's I, a great yeah, deal. Yeah, and um, I had expensive. I, yeah, and I had I had bought prosthetic parts prior on eBay, and some turned out to be scams. So I thought this was a scam. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, you, you wouldn't insane. think that. Yeah. So I, I wasn't really too hopeful that this was actually going to come through. And sure enough, the FedEx guy shows up at your house and you've got 10 feet. <laughs> it's like Christmas times 10. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, I would go to a friend who's uh, my friend Keppa and he's really forward thinking and he would, you know, take out the knife and we started cutting toes off and, and doing this and doing that and trying different size feet. Maybe a shorter foot would work better because there's really nowhere to look for what's, you know, what the standard is for adaptive surfing. If you did a Google image search, nothing would come up. It was just basically try something. And if you fall flat on your face on the wave, that didn't work. You try something else. If you could actually ride the wave pretty well, then it worked. And did, did you look at other sports like running or? Yeah. So I, I, I started looking at snowboarding and I realized they started using, it's sort of, it's called a heel wedge and it's, it basically sort of forces you to bend your knee a little bit more by putting the toe a little further down than you normally would. Um, and, and I, I think that really helps snowboarders a lot in, in, in the snow and, um, so I would start changing the angle on my foot and doing this, trying to mimic the same thing. And that really helped. It, it wasn't really my, my first breakthrough, I guess, in, in prosthetics and surfing was angling the toes out. I, I went on a snowboarding trip and I found that the bindings can change. And when you change the angle of your binding, it would sort of open your stance up. Um, my prosthetic is on my back foot. I'm a regular footed. So when I'm surfing, it's my back foot. And by angling that toe out, I'm actually able to get a little bit more surface area on the board when I bend down. So I'm not just directly on my tippy toes. I'm actually, I got my stance sort of widened up a little bit. And that seemed to help a lot. And it's crazy. I mean, I'm talking like a quarter inch difference it was wow. night and day. Yeah. And so, so right now you're, you're 
your prosthetic is angled out a little bit. A little toe out, yeah. But it's stationary. It's stationary, and correct. you don't use bindings when you no, surf. No, no, don't use bindings. The foot shell, which covers the prosthetic, actually stays on the surfboard really well. It's a common question I get. Don't you slip right off with your... And, and yeah. no, um, that's sort of the least of the worries. It, it's, it sticks really well, and I've got a deck pad on the back of my board, and it grips right in the deck pad. Um, so that's not an issue whatsoever. It's more your stance, and it's your flexibility. I, I also thought early on that my friends would tell me, if you don't you know, get really low you're never going to get barreled. And I really want to get barreled. You've got to get low and low. So I would practice on the floor getting low and low. And I thought, okay, if I get a prosthetic that's got a lot a lot of flex, I can get really low. Um, so I would get a f- really flexible prosthetic and it would be rated for somebody, let's say, that is half my body weight. So it would think Great. that, and it would really flex. And I started finding that even though I could get really low, all that energy would get thrown out and that flex would not turn the surfboard. Um, it would uh, absorb in the foot. All my energy would absorb in that foot and it would stay there. The board wouldn't turn. So I couldn't get the board on rail and without the board on rail, you don't get speed and then you can't do any maneuvers and it just, it's a wash. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of went back, okay, I need a stiffer foot because I'd rather turn the board on rail and by opening my toe out, I can get a little bit lower and I can get that stiffness and that drive. And then my biggest breakthrough was I, I got a, a, a prosthetic endorsement, Osur. They're out of Iceland. They're the global leader in prosthetics, and they sent me a carbon fiber foot. How do you spell the name of the company? Osur, O-S-S-U-R. Okay. Um, and carbon fiber versus a rubber ball joint is like apples and oranges. Uh, that carbon, it's, it is a godsend for amputees. It really holds that tension, and it like it's almost got a little brain in itself. It knows when to release that energy, and that energy is released right into that surfboard rail, and it turns right on a dime. Um, and carbon, it's so sensitive. I can I can with, on land with my carbon foot. If you were to put a penny on the ground and I step on it, I can feel that. Wow. It's crazy. Carbon is amazing for prosthetics. That's awesome. So you've been really at the forefront of innovation when it comes to prosthetic legs. I mean, I have a friend, Danny, who surfs locally yep. with a prosthetic leg. Did yep. you help her get hers? Or I, I actually was talking to her this morning. Um, she's amazing, first and foremost. She's uh, she's an above the knee amputee, so it's a little. She's getting two joints that are replicated, which is a little bit more difficult. I'm fortunate that I have my knee, and um, in surfing, the the really good knees right now, they're all electronic and very difficult to take in the water because mm. electronics and water don't mix. So she has a little bit more of a challenge than myself. Um, but she uh, she surfs like incredible. She wears a wetsuit. You wouldn't know she's an adaptive surfer at all. Well, you get barreled. Like I've seen pictures of you, GoPro shots of you getting absolutely shacked out of your mind. So so what are the disadvantages? I mean, talk to me. You know, yeah, disadvantages. Um, yeah, what can I, happen? The, 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 besides the actual mechanics of the prosthetic and not having those, those I mean, because I... I think a lot of times we really take what our body can do for granted, the amount of flexibility and, and just the resilience of actual human limbs. But besides that, I would say walking on slippery rocks, slippery reef. Um, a plus side is I can step on a sea urchin. It doesn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Another downside is my leash gets wrapped like crazy on oh. my prosthetic. It just really tangles. Um, and that's kind of a huge thing because almost every other wave, I'm trying to use my, my good toes and my good foot to sort of untangle that and, and it kind of messes up your flow of surfing. And it's really nice when I can surf without a leash. I wonder if um, we can get you a leash that will not tangle. Yeah, I've been, I've been trying to work on okay. that. Yeah, that kind of stuff. Another thing is actually physically losing the limb in the surf. I've, I've lost a couple limbs and I didn't have insurance and it was, my family is out doing a, a search and rescue underwater diet. You know, we've got the mask and snorkels and or my cousins and aunties are all combing the sandbar for my leg. And, um, that's a, that's a real issue for a lot of people is losing your leg in the water. And, um, another one is I just, I, I don't like peeing in my wetsuit with my prosthetic because it's just, you know, when you're, when you're surfing, you like to pee in your wetsuit. Everybody does it. And, Everybody uh, does yeah, it. Yeah. Don't um, say you don't do it. Yeah. There's two people. There's people that pee and the people that lie about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, and those are, you know, those are, those are really minor disadvantages compared to what we can do. Um, yeah. Yeah. What you can do is incredible. You're really fit. So I'm curious to know what you do to train and, and, you know, do you do a lot of balance exercises or, um, I've started doing a lot of stuff on the BOSU ball, I would say, um, surfing. I I, I've for a good 10 years after the shark attack, I had really bad prosthetics and was really ill fitted. I had a, you know, hideous limp, a terrible limp. And I, I really attribute to not having back issues. I've never had any back pain, um, is to surfing is to, I, I think, you just you're in the water. You're paddling. Everything's getting stretched out. Surf, swim. I think it's just. I think it's an amazing sport for amputees. Um, I can't say that enough. You know, you you walk all day long. You've got this limp. You've got gravity pulling on you. 
you jump in the ocean, it's, it's incredibly healing and surfing is incredibly healing. Oh, it's great. And you live in one of the best places in the world for it in Kauai. Yeah. And you've become pretty active in helping other adaptive surfers. I mean, yesterday there was a clinic and I'm guessing you were there pushing people in the waves. Yeah. I I feel sort of that, you know, inside in my heart to give back because there just wasn't really too much when I started. And I can't imagine the stoke of these kids being able to go to the beach and having somebody show them that you can do this and and by your side and pushing them in the waves and, and, Oh, he's got the same exact foot as me and, and he can do this. I could someday do this. I, I, there's really value in that um, because it's such a niche thing. And, and to be able to come to the beach and help these kids who want to learn how to surf with their prosthetics. We had um, here at the shores, I believe, uh, three months ago, I think almost 70 kids from around the country come here with their prosthetics wanting to surf. It's, I mean, it literally brought tears to my eyes. And you see the parents on the beach. Some of them are, are still surfers and never thought their kids could ride waves. And the kids standing up on the wave. And I mean, there's not a dry eye on the beach. Oh, I love that. I'm sure people driving or listening to this right now have tears in their eyes. Do you have a memorable moment from surfing that you could share? Um, I would say that first day I stood up at Ledbetter definitely um, was very memorable. I've had a couple waves at home where just everything came together. Um, The prosthetic was, it it was in the perfect spot on the board. I mean, there's a sweet spot on your surfboard and it's the size of a quarter and you're standing there and the board is turning exactly how you want it to turn and you kick out of the wave and, um, and you're just like, you know, this is, yeah, it's, it just feels really good. And there's been a few moments like that. There's been last year getting second, um, at the contest here in La Jolla at the world championships. That was a pretty cool moment as well. Um, because it was a, a, a bit of a road to get there and training and, and, um, there's there's a you know a bit of competition and, and that was very special for me and my family. Well, we'll be rooting for you today and tomorrow. And when this podcast comes out, I'll be able to let everybody know how Mike did. So I want to talk a little bit about photography because all the surf photographers I've met that are really good were bodyboarders like yeah. Todd Glazer, yep. and you're this incredible photographer. But you shoot on land and in water. So tell me a little bit about sort of what what campaigns you've been working on, what you enjoy taking photos of and sort of your photography process. Yeah. Um, I, I love photography. I, I've, I found it sort of an, a creative outlet. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a creative guy myself and a, there's just, there's something about, I guess, telling a story. Like I, I love film, but film sometimes, I mean, it, it's, it's a process and, and you can kind of get lost in the music unless you're really good at it. I think a photo, like you take a still photo and sometimes you can t- say everything you ever want to say in one picture. And I, I love the value of that. And, um, it, it's, I've been very fortunate to have a lot of good mentors in my life and be around a lot of beautiful, incredible moments. When I was younger, I, I would, we would go, we have this beautiful coast called the Nepali coast and, mm. um, go down there with my friends and the sun is setting and there's a rainbow and we're underneath a waterfall and there's dolphins jumping like these situations. That I'm like, is this, I haven't seen this on TV. This can't be real, like unbelievable. And I'd want to share it with my family and, and they would, it didn't happen. And so we'd start getting disposable cameras. And, and I think I just kind of want to share that stoke with my family to show that this is because my parents wouldn't go in the water. And sometimes you're in the water, you just see the most incredible things. And I, I've, I've, it's sort of grown on me and I just, I, I really love it. Is there a photo you're really proud of right now? Um, I mean, I'm sure there's a yeah, lot, but one. I, I've I've been really enjoying taking um, detail shots of sharks. I know a lot of people they, they they go underwater to shoot sharks or fish, and they'll use a wide angle lens. And I've been fortunate to dive in some really really amazing places that have incredible water clarity. So you can actually use a longer length uh, telephoto underwater, a longer focal length, um, and that's just because the water is so clear. You don't you don't get that. Um, sort of noise between yourself and the subject um, and you can pull in and get a little different perspective and I've been enjoying taking almost detail shots really high res detail shots of sharks whether it's you know the denticles on the skin or the eyes um, the teeth the fins and and blowing it up and printing it in large format at almost life size I, I think it's it's pretty cool and I've that's kind of sort of been a passion project of mine you're you're in really high demand right now so how do you decide what projects to say yes to um I, I actually was listening to this podcast the guy talking about when you when there's a lot of things going on in your life and um I guess if it's not a definite yes it's a definite no um and to really you know to really trust that. yeah to really trust I guess in the bigger picture um I mean you get to a point where it's like you get all these incredible opportunities, but the, the really the only thing you can't really buy or you can't really sort of use your talent or leverage is time. And, and time is something that 
everybody's got a finite amount of and to really you know if you put time into this but you can't do this and to really I guess prioritize what is important in your life and to find time for that because time is something we can't ever take back so right now what are what are kind of the most important things in your life I would say besides my, my family and, and having my girlfriend happy is is um is I guess sharing my stoke of sharks um with as many people as I can and, and sort of, sh- you know, sharing that they're not these crazy man eating creatures and also helping kids in similar situations like myself and helping them learn how to surf with their prosthetics. And I- I've been fortunate and not so much fortunate that we've had a lot of shark attacks in Hawaii, but that I've been able to visit shark attack survivors in the hospital right after attacks. And that it's a small network of people in a coconut, like a wire, like I literally is a shark attack and I'm getting a, a phone call or an email of that person's phone or email within minutes and I'm able to go to the hospital and talk to them right as it's and I think that's a bit of a a good way to start the healing process is to have somebody in a similar situation yeah I just saw on your Instagram you and Bethany went and Bethany Hamilton visited someone yeah yeah and and if if the shark attack is on Kauai and she's home we try to do that a lot together we'll walk into the hospital and say who we are and, and just offer our assistance and kind of you know there's the questions people have after losing a limb it's all the same everybody has the same questions and there's Sometimes it's hard. Your doctor isn't going to have those answers. Or if your doctor does have those answers, how does he know? Because he's not missing a limb. And to ask somebody that's in an exact situation as yourself, um, there's, it's, you know, that's pretty valuable. Oh, it's really cool that you do that. And you're running now. Correct. Beach running. Yeah. It's been a trip. Um, I, for a long time, I mean, going through high school, I hated running and, and running wasn't something I was really passionate about. And after the attack and, and leading up to about four years ago, I didn't do any running. And it was basically the limitation of my prosthetic. It was the technology wasn't there. And I would do this sort of one hop, two hop, and then stop and then walk and then one hop, two hop. And that was my run. And I, there was, there was nothing glamorous about it. There was not, I, I would be at the airport and my family's trying to catch a flight and I'm the guy dragging my bag doing this one hop, two hop behind. And um, it was it was always in the back of my mind, this would be really cool to go running. And I went to Iceland uh, where Osur is based out of and they had fitted me for a surfing prosthetic. And they, they when you make a prosthetic, it's almost like a shoe where the socket is exactly custom fit for your residual limb. So they had my mold for my limb. And before they gave me the surfing leg, they're like, here, try this on. And it's this big running blade. And I was cool. like, wow, this is amazing. I've, you know, I saw this in the Paralympics and this is what the Paralympians wear. And I, I put it on and it fit amazingly. And they had an indoor track and field right there. And I, I remember, okay, I mean, you know, this is like, it, was, it wasn't a moment that was building up. There was no, you know, media. It was not, it was just this cold day in Iceland with a couple, with, a, you know, with my prosthetist and, and another lady in, in this track. And, and she's like, do it, go run. And I, you know, I wasn't going to YouTube it, how to run again, because it had been a long time, many years. And, um, I just started taking my first step and it, it, you, I think I took a couple steps to really feel that it wouldn't break on me and to kind of give that trust that it's going to hold up. And then you started next steps a little faster and 10 seconds later, you're running full speed. It was one of the coolest feelings. Uh, I would say that might be the best feeling I've ever had in my life. That feeling of flight. Like it literally felt like I was just, I don't know, flying through the air. It was incredible. And I think I didn't stop running for the rest of the day until the building closed and they had to kick me out. Um, it was absolutely, I was calling my parents back home in Hawaii and, and tears in my eyes. And I'm like, I ran, I ran, I ran. And it was the strangest thing. So I, I flew home a couple of days later and I got back to Hawaii and I always dream that, um, I don't have a prosthetic that I have two legs. Every dream I have, I am able-bodied. I have, I have two legs. And it was the very first time that I dreamt I had a prosthetic. And it was the the night I got home and I dreamt I had a running blade and I was going to my parents' house to show them that I could run and I couldn't run. And I was like, I promise I did it in Iceland. I ran, I ran, I swear I I ran and let me try it on the concrete. And sure enough, I couldn't run. Let me try it with shoes. I couldn't run. Let me try it without shoes. I couldn't run. And I woke up in this cold sweat in the middle of the night and, or it was early morning. And I was like, whoa, that was a weird dream. And and I looked down and my running blade is right there on the ground. I'm like, I'm going to go wake up my parents and see if this was all the dream. And I, I, in the dark, I woke my parents up. They probably thought, what the heck is going on? Who's here at our house? And, you know, and, um, my parent, my dad comes out like half naked and he's got his phone out and I like run around the house and I did it. And my mom, my parents are crying. It was like this really cool moment. And I'm like, I knew it all happened. I knew it was real. Um, it was very cool. I love this story. Mike, I want to keep talking to you forever. I know you've got a contest to go to. <laughs> wow. 
We're going to go to the quick and dirty round. Okay. This is so great. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Absolutely. Thank I, I you. think so many people are going to get so much out of this. What's your mantra pre-contest? Like anything or routine? Do you have any um, things? I, I've been drinking yourself? bulletproof coffee lately. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> I, I know it's a bit of a trend in Hawaii and a lot of uh, people in the triathlon world do that. Um, Butter or coconut oil in your coffee? Um, a little bit. I, a little bit of both. Yeah. A little bit of both. Um, and that really helps. And maybe it's like a lot. My girlfriend this morning is like, that's a placebo effect. And I'm like, no, I swear it, it works, you know? And um, I, I like to watch uh, like surf videos. We've got Andy Irons from my, my home island of Kauai. And, and I've been finding some YouTube videos of him surfing really small waves um, because the contest is going to be in a little smaller surf and, and just watching him surf and I guess listening to some good music. And um, and, and also at the event, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of talking and everybody, you know, you're talking away and it's kind of nice to just get in the car and to sort of get all those distractions out and really kind of get back to your headspace. Um, I, I do a lot of surfing by myself at home and I, I seem to surf the best when there's just nobody around and it's just quiet and I can really, I guess, get in the right, you know, mind frame of the of the surfing. Um, so that's kind of what I do. What's your music choice? Uh, good question. I've, um, to be honest, I, I listen to on Spotify, you can listen to soundtracks of old surf videos, um, of, of surf videos from the late nineties of Taylor steel movies. And it brings, and it brings, yeah, exactly. And it brings back memory of just that surf stoke and segments and just the really good surfing that everybody was doing. So it kind of, it, it gets me in the right mind frame. It's like punk music, a lot of punk music. Um, where's your favorite place to take a date? Uh, I like to barbecue on the beach, I would say. Um, yeah, probably a beach barbecue under the stars. And what's your favorite post contest meal? Ooh. <sighs> what's your favorite thing to barbecue? My favorite thing probably to barbecue is if you have fresh fish. Um, that's really good. I, vegetables, I, a little bit of meat. Um, do you know Kimmy Warner? I do. Yeah. She's a good friend. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you guys might know yeah. each other. Yeah, we've, we've done some photo shoots together. I can't even keep up with her underwater. She just disappears and goes down in the deep, and I'm on the surface waiting for her to come up to snap a shot. Oh, she's yeah, she's pretty yeah. amazing. I could see you two having a lot of and fun And her together. Instagram's amazing, too, of all the food she cooks and how she cooks it. It's beyond. So if, if I asked her this, and, and I'd love to ask you this. If you could throw any kind of party, what sort of party would you throw, and who's coming? Okay, good question. It would be at Kelly's Ranch. It would be a 24-hour surf barbecue music party. I would invite um, my family, um, a lot of my close friends. I would invite guys like Andy, and I have a good friend who passed away, Cyan Malowski. I'd invite his family, um, my girlfriend, and uh, and some of just the, the local friends at some of my local beaches. And we would just we would have jet skis in there, and we would tow, and we would paddle, and we would just have fun. And yeah, Kelly, I hope you're listening to this. If not, Mark hint, Price, hint, Kelly. You read a lot, actually, I could tell, yeah. with, with, especially about sharks. Any books that you gift most often or you recommend? Um, I don't know the title of this. I, I read it recently on a boat, um, and it's pretty cool. Like, There's two pla good places, I think, to read books, and that's on a plane and on a boat. It's just yes. some, you just get in some, it's something. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Um, but, uh, and I don't know if I'm, it's a Swedish book, and it, I believe it's the, it's about a man who, on his 100th birthday, escaped his sort of elderly home and these adventures and it kind of brings back sort of all these different times I guess in the last hundred years these historical times and sort of interwines I guess history modern history along with his life and it's it's fiction um but it's inc it's an incredible read I, I'm spacing on the name it's like the hundred year old man who escaped the retirement home or something like that it sounds awesome we'll put it in the show notes yeah. and find it um any advice you could give to people who who just want to live more wildly they're a little afraid of going after their dreams and they just need a little kick in yeah. the rear. Um, you know, there, there, there is something to be said about just go and do it and do this and do and, but And then sometimes, and some people it's taking small steps and just, I, I really think that habits are born by just starting small and trying something over and over and, and start these healthy habits. If you, you know, if you're afraid of just do a little bit every day, um, cause it'll all add up and, and days as you get older, go by as we know a lot faster. Um, so eventually you'll get to where you want to go and, and just, I don't know, it's, you know, as adaptive surfers, we we're depending on carbon, we're depending on this, we're depending on that and, and chairs and, and whatnot, but you're really, your strongest is your mind. I, I really think it all begins and ends with the mind and to, and to just believe you can and to, and to know that you can and, and start small and, and just do it. Oh, that's such great advice. Um, we ask all guests this one more question. 
if you could go back and tell your 15 year old self, what would you tell him? And I'm guessing you're, you're probably similar yeah, to now, a, what you were like at 15. Um, yeah. It's just not to really worry about the small stuff. Um, there's so many things that come up in life and you think it's the end of the world or you get nervous about this. And at the big picture, when you're like that hundred old man in the, you know, the chair and you're looking back at your life and you want to escape the, the elderly home, it's like, none of these things really matter. Find what matters and really stick to that. And everything else is just, I guess, external noise. And it doesn't, it's, it's not lasting and it'll be over soon and, and don't worry about it. That's such great advice. I think I want to end there. Mike, okay. where can we find more about you? Um, I'm, I'm very active on social media. My Instagram is my name, M-I-K-E-C-O-O-T-S, um, Mike Coots. Otherwise, I have a website, MikeCoots.com, with my photography. And um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on Wild Ideas, Mike. Well, Loved having you on. Thank you. Thank you. What an epic human. Thank you so much for listening to this show, to Mike Coots for sharing your amazing story, and to the Surf Diva Surf School in La Jolla for letting us use their dolphin room to do this interview. Thanks also to REI for sponsoring this show, to Dana Edmonds for letting us use your photos, he's an amazing photographer, as well as Patty who did great video on Mike Coots that I'll link to in the show notes. If you like this show or have feedback, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me on the website, or the best way is to write a review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you're streaming this show. You can also sign up for our email newsletter to get the latest updates and notes at wildideasworthliving.com. And if you want to see the show notes of any episode, just click play on any of the shows on wildideasworthliving.com, and the show notes will magically appear. We have a great new lineup this year. I'm planning to do some more adventures, including a through hike and some great speaking events with REI. Thank you again for listening. If you're new to this show, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Excited to have you back. Wherever you are in the world, remember some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. We have Rhonda Patrick, health expert, coming up next. Donna Carpenter, the CEO of Burton. Amy Vitali, an amazing photographer, and so many more. See you soon.